full-scale warfare. Why don't you grow up? Why don't you grow up? So how did they end up wearing handcuffs? I think he had cameras everywhere. Isn't that obsessive behavior? Border Wars. And could you live next door to Party Central? Yeah! Ever been under siege? That's what it's like. A Vietnam vet versus the Berkeley frat boys next door. They're on my roof. They're trying to break in the back door. I'm just being overwhelmed. So why did you decide to move into this house knowing you'd be surrounded by fraternity? Sigma Alpha, why? And when a friendship goes down. Oh my gosh. They put it on Facebook that we were the blame for them all getting sick. A fence goes up. That's more like the Berlin Wall. They started painting pictures of pigs on the walls. But that's just for starters. What is this? Find out when you meet the people next door. When it comes to the neighbor from hell, we won the Powerball lottery. Here now, David Muir and Elizabeth Vargas. Good evening and happy new year. David is away tonight. And we look at neighbors tonight who definitely are not making resolutions to be nice to each other. Starting with these people next door who have serious boundary issues in every possible way. Here's Tom Yamas. On patrol with the 2020 Nasty Neighbor Watch, dispatched to the front lines of Why Can't We All Just Get Along by neighbor expert and ABC News consultant Bob Borzada. Of all the kinds of neighbor disputes, there's nothing like a good border war to get people's blood boiling. Tonight, two tales of terrifying territoriality, straight from Borzada's inbox. First, from Poughkeepsie, New York, along the historic Hudson River, a call for help. The Ennis family uh, says they have, quote, the mother of all neighbor disputes. We've had quite a bit of trouble with the neighbors. And so this is the entryway now into, the, into all your misery? Uh, yes, please follow me into uh, my secret garden. There's no garden, and it's not a secret. Liz Ennis is in a blowtorch hot bickering battle with her backdoor neighbors, Steve and Loretta Jager. If nothing else, the 65 security videos Ennis put up on YouTube reveal clashing lifestyles and landscaping. The Jagers are Martha Stewart style neat nicks. While the Ennis's backyard, judge for yourself. He's got a perfectly landscaped lawn that he loves, and maybe he thinks your backyard is a mess. Part of our problem is that we've been spending money on his lawsuits and whatever. You don't have any money left to, to clean up the backyard. Oh, no. Given the personality differences, a border skirmish was bound to erupt. The first salvo comes when the Ennis's accuse Steve Jager of aggressive lawn mowing, kicking up clouds of dust, and sometimes just kicking. Then, the Ennis's say the Jagers became chronic, petty, Complainers. He's complained about derelict cars, barbecues, lights, birds, vermin. The list goes on and on. On and on and on and on and on. But it turned to all out war when the Jagers took a drastic step that would forever block the Ennis eyesore behind them. This is the problem, huh? Yeah. Jager hires a surveyor who says the deed to the Ennis property is wrong. She owns less than she thought, a lot less. Then D-Day, Jager builds a fence right across what Ennis considers her land. He never owned the property, um, never. Nothing says I hate you like an eight foot, $5,000 hardwood stockade fence, especially when it's being used as an attack position to drown out your neighbor's barbecue with a hose. It's very disturbing, it's very upsetting, and it's so incredibly wrong. Ennis sued Jager over the alleged land grab twice. What was the meanest thing you ever told him? I said, does it suck to wake up in the morning and find out that you're still you? But two judges have sided with Jager, saying he's right about the property lines and his fence is fine. So we heard from the Ennis family. Let's see what the Jagers have to say. Over at what Liz Ennis would consider the enemy camp, Steve and Loretta Jager reluctantly told us their side of the story. We asked to settle it between the two surveyors. She said, no, it's going to court. If this it is went to court. She lost it. It's not her property.
They say it's Liz who is unreasonable and a nuisance. This is what she dumped in my backyard. What is that? What am I looking at there? She killed all the grass, put the logs down, and disputed property. She met her lights on us for four and a half years. Mm -hmm. How would you like that? That was shining into your backyard? Yeah, what no, she did to our house. house. <laughs> it lighted up a whole backyard. It's like a tennis court. Now it's time to go back to the Ennis family and find out what they have to say. Liz, we were just at your neighbor's place. Sure. They showed us some very interesting photos. Were you shining spotlights on your neighbor's living room to kind of harass them? No. Liz also denies killing the grass. It's the Neat Nicks versus the Mess Squad. So who's in the right? We'll find out shortly. But first, we're off to check out another report of a neighbor from hell. This just in at NeighborsFromHell.com headquarters. An email from Paul Sahaki and Catherine Gannon up in Cooperstown, New York. They say they have a shocking neighbor from hell story. The Sohakis have been in a very bad neighbor dispute with their neighbor, Gene Ellis. It says here the neighbor attempted to steal their land. Quote, for safety reasons, we had to film our neighbor whenever he came to us. And guys, it sounds like this is when the real trouble started. This when is, did you get a life and stay off This is property? real imaginative, Gene. Putting up no trespassing signs. Yes, oh, wow. Property. That's Gene Ellis. Paul Sohaki and his wife, Catherine Gannon, say he's the neighbor from hell. What's your house over there? Their house sits on 12 scenic uh. acres in Otsego County, New York. Gene Ellis has more than 50, but it's still not big enough for the both of them. You can't see any houses from here. It's uh, completely secluded. <laughs> but, but you found a, a reason to fight. 52 acres wasn't enough. He needed, you know, more of our land. It all started because Paul and Catherine say Gene's driveway crossed a sliver of their land. You guys have 12 acres. He has 52 acres. Yes. And for eight years, you guys fought over this space right here. He never asked permission. He said, you're not going to prevent us from driving on this driveway. Paul and Catherine installed security cameras to document Ellis, and he started snapping pictures back. I'm on my own land. Someone's taking pictures of me. Oh, my gosh. So you finally went out and bought a camera, eh? Say <laughs> cheese. Oh, yeah. You've been nothing but the best neighbor to us, let me tell you. Come right up to here and with cameras and um, yelling things. And Paul and Catherine say that Ellis was harassing them and trespassing on their property. They caught him on camera, dumping dirt, mowing the lawn, and posting no trespassing signs. Gene, you are the worst freaking neighbor that has ever existed. Well, why don't you listen to yourself and grow up? Uh, uh, grow up! Children grow up! Than you. Grow up. Hey, hey, why don't you grow up? You grow why don't you grow up? up? But things don't get really interesting until Paul and Catherine take their videos to the county district attorney, John Meal, pleading with him to do something. When we come back, he does. But you won't believe who winds up in handcuffs. Oh, by, by idiot, by liar, by criminal. When we come back, the border wars hit DEFCON 3. Gene, just stop. There's reality and there's reality. Plus, a chainsaw massacre. You heard the buzzing of the chainsaw? The angels say. It's game on and fence down when we return. Twenty twenty continues with the people next door. There are some tried and true strategies to turn the tide in a neighborly border war. You can build a fence, you can file a lawsuit, or if you're Liz Ennis in Poughkeepsie, New York, you can fire up your trusty chainsaw. Now that's a game changer. Her backdoor neighbor, Steve Jager, put up a fence on what Liz considers her property. After her legal efforts failed, she turned to more direct action. Figuring the best defense is no fence, she ordered her handyman, Jose, to go to work. When you heard the buzzing of the chainsaw? The angel sang. Okay, let's hear it again. As the chainsaw buzzes, we begin to wonder, how does one get to this point? A couple of times it has happened where people will reach out to me and they wind up being the neighbor from hell themselves. What did you think about that when they chainsawed your fence? Oh, we were very upset. Chainsaw my fence down. The Jagers sued and then settled with the Ennises, but neither side is admitting to any wrongdoing. If you could talk to her right now, what would you, you say? talk to her. Why? I'm talking to a wall. Today, the fractured fence has since been mended. 
And you don't think they're going to do anything else to your fence? I don't, you don't, think they're I don't chainsaw care what again. they do. Police department's on alert. They step on my property. They come over my property. They're probably going to get arrested. And while the Ennis' homeowner's insurance will pay the $7,500 for the new fence, Liz Ennis says she's not done fighting. Well, I'm not done exploring every possibility to retrieve my property, no. You think you've been a good neighbor? I don't think I was, in the end, a good neighbor, no. I was not nice to Mr. Yeager any more than he was to us. Do good fences make good neighbors? No. My cameras make good neighbors. Fence doesn't do nothing. Meanwhile, up in Cooperstown, New York, Paul Sohaki and his wife, Catherine Gannon, the dispute starts around here, right? Yeah. Are battling with neighbor Gene Ellis over where his driveway ends and their property begins. He was redefining the border closer and closer to our house. You felt like he was inching closer and closer to your property. Oh, yes, definitely. Paul and Catherine sued and then settled. Gene Ellis agreed to move his driveway off their property. The civil suit agreement was that he was not allowed to be on our property or it was contempt of court. Case closed, right? Wrong. Because Paul and Catherine kept their cameras rolling. What's that over there that connected to that tree? That's one of our cameras. These are the cameras that we use. Satellite information's encoded in on them so that you can go on the internet and track exactly where you've been. What was it like to live in that world? I mean, you, you basically lived in your own kind of sick reality show. <laughs> it was a reality yeah, yeah, show. Paul and Catherine and Gene all starring in an eight year long saga. Go ahead. They both might call the knucklehead next door. Gene, just stop. There's reality and there's reality. In this scene, Gene comes cruising through their woods like Bigfoot on a bulldozer. He came through this opening here and bulldozed the whole creek flat so that he could have a pathway to drive over here. Was that illegal? He did get arrested for that. Gene Ellis was put on a six-month probationary period for trespassing. But Paul and Catherine say he continued to harass and threaten them, even calling the police on them numerous times without cause. Going on a family walk on the street. We're on a public road. You need to leave us alone. Gonna call the police and tell them some more lies. Gene, go ahead. Let's see, buddy. Armed with their videos as evidence, they lobby the local district attorney, John Meal, to take action against their neighbor, Gene Ellis. Just listen to this tense phone call from the DA that Catherine recorded. He was walking around about 30 feet into our land, walking around on our property. That's horrendous. I... That is against the court order. He is not allowed to do that. If you're not going to uphold a court order, what kind of DA are you? I sure am glad I don't have neighbors like either of you two. You're not afraid of him. This whole thing is ridiculous. All of you are acting like 10-year-olds. You saw the videos. All of them. No crime committed by Mr. Ellis that you saw. Nothing. The DA, John Meal, says Paul and Catherine's videos were more revealing than they realized. So the evidence they showed you actually showed you something much different, which was what? It showed them actually committing a crime against him with all of these videos. Uh, it was the best evidence against themselves. The DA finally did take action but not the action Paul and Catherine expected. They were arrested, both of them. They were eventually arrested when we actually had some independent evidence of a witness who was able to confirm that the Sahakis were following Mr. Ellis around. Okay, he went the other direction. And taking pictures of him. State police arrested Paul and Catherine. They were handcuffed, fingerprinted, and charged with stalking Gene Ellis. All of the evidence, every shred of evidence that they gave me, was against themselves. Paul and Catherine never spent any time in jail, and the case was dismissed by a judge. Proof, they say, that the DA misread their video evidence, that the charges were trumped up, the case built exclusively on statements from Ellis's friends and relatives. The DA was out to get me, the police were out to get me. They claimed there was a conspiracy against them by you, the police, and the Ellis family and friends. What, what do you say to that? I know they do, and that's, that's just completely incorrect. And if they truly believe that, I feel sorry that they do. You think it became obsessive on it, their part? I believe they are obsessed with Gene Ellis. Gene Ellis declined to talk to 2020 on camera. Perhaps he thinks that, once again, his antagonistic neighbors will make his case for him. When you look back on your behavior, you had cameras everywhere, you were documenting every single second of your life. Mm -hmm. 
Isn't that obsessive behavior? Not in the context. It actually is very rational behavior. If you were in the situation that we were in, it was the logical, smart thing to do to protect our family. After all that, Gene Ellis blinked first. He moved. So Paul and Catherine get to say, we win. Except now they're moving too, relocating for Paul's work. Can these neighbor disputes actually get resolved ever? Yes, I believe that they can, but it's going to take time, it's going to take money, and a lot of anguish in many cases. So if you're looking for something that is quick and foolproof, it's the M word, move. When you look back on it, mm -hmm. you know, the eight years, the videotaping, <laughs> the fights with the police, was it worth it for, what is this? This is what, 10, 10, 12 feet? Without a doubt, it, it was definitely worth it because it not ended up being a fight about the land. It was more of a fight about justice. The point was it was a bully. That was the issue yeah. for us. When it comes to the neighbor from hell, we won the Powerball lottery. So who do you think was the real bully in that Cooperstown feud? We're live tweeting tonight, so let us know and use the hashtag ABC2020. We'll be right back. Next, how'd you like this for your scenic view? It's what one man recorded living on Frat Row. Ever been under siege? From booze to butts to butting heads. One man's crusade against the frats next door. When we come back. Hundreds of calls to the police. $60,000 spent in surveillance equipment and cameras. Must be the work of someone who lives in one of the country's worst crime zones, right? Uh, no, just stuck living on Fraternity Row. But the only thing this angry neighbor is pledging is to get the authorities to crack down on the frat boys next door. Here's ABC's Aditi Roy. Medical Emergency District 3. For students at UC Berkeley, the school year kicked off with a crash course in the perils of binge drinking. Berkeley 1, engine 5, we need an ambulance. A night of partying in 2013 launched an armada of ambulances to cart off the casualties. Cal students are getting so drunk. Passed out students being lugged out of frat houses. The emergency room was full of drunk students. Startling images from our San Francisco station, KGO. Now imagine you weren't just watching this on TV, you were living it. Your house on the edge of Berkeley's Fraternity Row. If you've ever been under siege, uh, that's what it's like. Meet Paul Geisels, a Vietnam vet fighting a battle he never expected on the home front. His weapon of choice? You better put cameras up because that's the only way you're going to protect yourself. With more than $60,000 worth of surveillance gear, Geisel says he's compiled enough footage for a documentary on Dionysian debauchery. I have video of them throwing 1.75 liter glass bottles of vodka at the front door of our house. He showed us some of the lowlights from his archives. Okay, here you can see a young lady running from the Zeta parking lot, and she just dropped her keys. So as she bends to get her keys, she just pulled a full moon. From half-naked women to public urination, lots of it. These are probably not scenes you'd like to witness on your street. Oh, there they go. There you can see the two guys naked, you know, running up the street. Now this is the gentleman right here who's gonna go over and drop his pants. There he goes. There he goes. And now he sticks his hands in his pants. But how did it come to this? Geisels used to help launch Navy planes from aircraft carriers, then braved a dozen Chicago winters as a firefighter EMT. In 1988, he and his wife, looking for some peace and quiet, moved to her treasured family homestead, this 1927 Dutch colonial back in Berkeley. My wife always wanted to move back to this house, and this was her grandmother's house. But Paul was gambling from the start. Their street, just one block from the University of California campus, was nestled among two dozen frats, their house right between two of them. So why did you decide to move into this house knowing you'd be surrounded by fraternities? Well, when we first moved here, um, things were actually pretty good. We were invited to the fraternities for their Monday night lobster and steak dinners. That was then. This is now. Why the change? Paul says with the explosion of cell phones and social media, Word of the parties now goes viral, and suddenly the gatherings have ballooned from 50 people to more than 500. 
the behavior was becoming more outrageous. It got so bad, he measured the noise levels from his yard. We started at 11 o'clock this morning. It is now 5.30. Parties not stopping at 12.30, quarter to one. They were going until 3, 4, 5 in the morning. But here you can see he says he's captured buses disgorging here. revelers. You can see she's naked from the waist down. They put a blanket around her. She can barely walk. And drunken brawls just outside his house. Naturally, Paul started complaining about the loud party. His garbage cans knocked over. Kids throwing things. And throwing up. And he says that's when things got personal. You've had furniture thrown from up there. Yep. You know, with the legs of chairs and stuff through the roof. I've had three burglaries in the last three months. He told police some of his Greek neighbors broke into his home. They're on my roof. They're trying to break in the back door. I'm just being overwhelmed. He says he's even taped them threatening his life. Oh, God. Oh, You've had death threats? Correct. How many? More than I can count. We've had windows shot out, saying that we're going to kill you, we're going to burn your house down. And he's not the only one who complained. We have 122 pages. His lawyer, Yolanda Wong, showed us this long list of police calls about Berkeley's frats. She says an average of 400 a year. Looking at the sheer number of times that they're called out and they respond, it doesn't seem like a light touch. The light touch is there's no arrests. They go and they say, oh, boys behave, but no one has taken the jail. When he's called Berkeley police, Paul says they've responded, but the parties haven't stopped. We're not getting really any help from the university or from the authorities. You cannot have authorities saying, yeah, they're breaking the law, but, eh, you know, it's going to keep happening. Why don't you take, take off, take a hike? 2020 reached out to the Berkeley police, who tell us they take all crimes seriously and address concerns about noise complaints, loud parties, and alcohol issues. And the university tells 2020 it works with its frats on safety issues and strips frats of their university affiliation if they break the rules. Live but Paul TV says news. that's not enough. Police are investigating the death of a young man at a UC Berkeley fraternity. He points to the recent death of a visiting student, Vibev Lumba, at a party inside nearby Zeta Psi. The cause? Released just two days ago, alcohol poisoning. The frat was stripped of its university recognition in 2010, but it continues to remain active. Now, full disclosure, I graduated from UC Berkeley in 1996, and while I only went to one frat party, I have a personal interest in hearing what today's underclassmen think about this home-brewed brouhaha. You live, I see, amongst a lot of fraternities here, right? I don't hear any music, any noise here. It's pretty quiet. I don't really feel bad because obviously your opportunity cost, you want to live here, it's worth it for you to live here, then you're going to have to put up with the noise and the nuisance. You've lived next door to a fraternity, and now you're a member of a fraternity. What was it like to live next door to a fraternity? When it's too loud, it just feels, you know, it's uncomfortable when you're trying to concentrate, focus. And most of the other times, it was the same thing as living anywhere else. There are plenty of places to live in Berkeley that are not front row. And so living on front row, I feel like, is a conscious decision to be near the fraternities. Finally, Paul made the conscious decision to move out, but he still hasn't surrendered. He's kept his cameras rolling and filed a lawsuit against almost anyone connected to his neighbor dispute, including 34 of Berkeley's fraternities. Our goal is to win in court, to have some change, to have some civility in this neighborhood. It's been an uphill battle. His original lawsuit was dismissed, but it's now going forward under a city ordinance, which an attorney for several of the defendants says they will continue to defend vigorously. But this vet says he'll keep fighting and taping, hoping he and his wife can someday come home. I'm strong enough to continue this and to keep it going until we have a resolution because I feel so strongly about this problem. So should he sell the house? Who would even buy that house, would you? Or should the police take a tougher line with those fraternities? Let us know your thoughts. Use the hashtag ABC2020. We'll be right back.
Next, a 12-foot tall fence was bad enough, but covering it with pig pictures? What did you think when you saw those pictures? Oh, that they were calling us pigs. When we return. They say that good fences make good neighbors, but in the story you're about to see, good fences make big fights, turning former best friends into bitter enemies. And the start of it all? Trees in the backyard and a juice machine. It may seem like a laughing matter, but it's not to them. Ryan Smith went to the Lone Star State to get the story. This neighbor tale begins in San Antonio at Vanessa Martinez's wedding. A backyard affair with guests including the folks from next door, Mary Lou and Rick Dominguez. There's Rick celebrating. We were very close. We went on vacations with them. Back then, it was nothing for Rick and Mary Lou to share meals with the friendly people a few steps away. The Martinez's. Dinners, cake, all that kind of stuff. Family matriarch Yolanda Martinez might have served up something like this. Yolanda loves Mexican food. But today, can't digest the problems her chosen cuisine seems to have created between the two families. This has been already two years and three months, and it's still going. What's been going on is a knockdown, drag out spat that made bitter enemies out of these former friends. Oh, yeah, it got pretty ugly. It happened online when the then Facebook friends clicked the unfriend button. Why? Believe it or not, it's all mixed up with fruit and vegetables in a juicer like this. Mary Lou wouldn't talk on camera, so Rick did the explaining. We do this thing called juicing, which we've done for years, and it's just real healthy for you. Yolanda remembers what Mary Lou wrote. She had posted that they were into the, the juicing. But the neighbors disagree about all the other juicy details. The actual Facebook posts are long gone. But there's no doubt what each side claims the other wrote squeezed the life out of the friendship. What did they say? They got on Facebook and said, your stupid recipe for juicing gave the whole family diarrhea. She was sending like, well, if you wouldn't be feeding your family fatty foods and lard and tortillas, and maybe they wouldn't be as big as they are. You got offended. I did. It absolutely juiced up the tension already simmering over this man. Another neighbor who was feuding with Rick over trees between their properties. When you saw that other neighbor having problems with Rick, what did you do? I intervened. Leading to the wall. The simmering tensions convince both sides to shut the other out and create what today is sort of the Berlin Wall of San Antonio, a wood picket fence built by Yolanda's husband. Dwarfed by Rick's roughly 12-foot behemoth of corrugated metal and wood. Technically, it's a detached covered patio. The fence and the almost Korean demilitarized zone around it with cameras facing back and forth has become a standing monument to neighborly hatred covered on the local news. At the center of this feud, quite literally, is this 12-foot high corrugated metal fence. And making one big headache for the cops. We're back and forth to those residences over and over and over again. Police Chief Bill McManus says the frustrating thing is, for the most part, what the feuding neighbors do isn't breaking the law. But boy, it makes you wonder about those laws. Oh my gosh. What like when Yolanda's on? husband, Tony, is repeatedly seen knocking down garbage cans using some sort of stick. Rick is convinced it's a cattle prod. It is a cow prod with two electrodes on it. He parades around with it constantly. With a cattle prod? Yolanda denies her family even owns a cattle prod and claims whatever Rick recorded is nothing compared to what he's done to them, starting with that fence. It may be scenic on Rick's side, not so much on Yolanda's. They started painting pictures of pigs on the walls. What did you think when you saw those pictures? Oh, that they were calling us pigs. First was the painted pig, then a painted donut followed by a stuffed pig hung off a pole. And then... What is this? That's him. We can't show it, but on this banner, Yolanda says that's a stuffed pig in a simulated sex act, along with an obscene message. What's he do? He's trying to taunt you? I don't know. Rick says what he was doing was responding to a camera Yolanda's family placed 13 feet high, violating his privacy. That's against the law, so I was trying to prove a point. But in some ways, that makes you look vulgar, because you're the one who's posting an F.U. sign and simulating a sex act to a toy pig. Well, tell him to stop videotaping us in our pool. But Rick is in the security camera arms race, too. 
In fact, he runs a surveillance business out of his home. And as the volley of accusations escalated, Yolanda's daughter Vanessa, that beaming bride from happier times, claimed she was being violated. We are being watched 24-7. He's enjoying making our lives miserable. Every time we would step foot outside, either the front door or the back door, he'd be out there harassing us. How was he harassing you when you would walk out of your house? As soon as we walked out of the house, he would start making the pig noises. Pig noises? <laughs> yep, just like these pig noises, Rick added to video he took of Yolanda and posted on YouTube. Once you get to that point where you are making pig sounds to harass your neighbors, you are emerging as the neighbor from hell. I have tried to be the one to be the strong one, and it's hard to be the rock to try to keep the family together. Especially after the garbage can incident. The animosity was bound to boil over, and sure enough, last January 13th, it got physical. So what's happening here? This is Rick. Yes. Yolanda's second daughter, Yvonne, and Rick on a collision course with a giant trash can. He's getting ready to put the trash can right in front of him. Oh, deliberately pushes it, yes. Watch again. Knocks her down. And she did have scrapes on her, on her legs, and right there he starts mocking her. But go next door, and it's a totally different view. She comes running towards me, kicks the trash can, fakes a fall, and then calls the police. Seeing this video right here from this perspective, it tells a different story. Of course it does. Still, it's the one incident that led to charges. Assault against Rick. He pled no contest and was fined in order to do community service and attend alternatives to conflict training. But could any training prepare him for Yolanda's retaliation against his security cameras? What did you think when you saw this? I was shocked. He's referring to the yard sign. They put up this sign that says perverts next door, cameras pointed at our house and our children. It's hurt our business. Uh, some of our customers are questioning why the neighbor's calling you a pervert. Rick says when the cops told Yolanda to remove the pervert sign, they just kept putting it back up. That was uncalled for because, because nobody believes it except them. This being America, each family filed dueling lawsuits. While justice takes its course, a judge has ordered both families to stop everything. But can any ruling ever get things back to normal on this block? Everyone else here sure hopes so. If I was a neighbor, you'd be interviewing me in prison, okay? I would knock the crap out of them. I'd much rather this be resolved before I go try to sell my house and be like, oh, by the way, there's this huge feud going on across the street. That's not exactly a selling point. If I were there with these folks, I would tell them this. We're all going to get together. We're going to sit down. We're going to laugh at each other. We're going to laugh at ourselves. Maybe we're not going to be best of friends anymore, but we have got to get this enemy stuff behind us. But even the time of peace on Earth wasn't enough to get these folks on board with that love thy neighbor stuff. It's a holiday season. Maybe you go over with a wreath. Uh, some Christmas presents. Hey, how can we make this right? Can I just, if, if we can we turn in, over a new leaf in the new year? If we lived in a fantasy world, that would work. So at this point, they're the ones that need to change. They need to change. You ever think about going over there and just no. giving them a hug and saying, how can we get this thing no. in the past? No. But these are people who used to be your friends. Mm -hmm. But they can also be people that you don't want as an enemy. Coming up, when your neighbor's a pig, literally. Is a pig really a pet? They're bringing home the bacon and keeping it to love. The pet is a part of my family. But one person's hog heaven is another person's pigsty. So who will win? Next. continues with the people next door. Here's Deborah Roberts. Yeah, that's all right. In the quiet of Midlothian, Virginia, a lone pig is making noise and news. We have breaking news surrounding the fate of Tucker the pet pig. <laughs> Tucker the pig is the pork that's pulling this community apart. On one side of the aisle, Tucker's supporters. On the other, angry residents who don't want to see their town turned into a pigsty. Mm -hmm. Is a pig really a pet? What does he do? 
He does everything a dog okay. would do. It's just like a dog. Kim Johnson's allergies wouldn't allow for a family dog. So she and husband Mark did some research on alternative pets, which is how Tucker got his pig's feet in the front door. Tucker's treated like royalty, taking a drive, dining on fruit and grains, and getting his beauty sleep. Since it's been cold, he'll sit by the fire. Pigs sleep 16 to 18 hours a day. I don't smell anything that indicates there's a pig in the house. Do you work overtime to try to keep him clean? He usually gets bathed every two weeks or so, and then I do usually put lotion on him because pigs do get dry skin. Tucker's willing to play the ham, posing for pigs in costume, and playing with kids of all ages. Everyone loved Tucker until the day someone didn't. <laughs> when did this happy-go-lucky story take a dark turn? Code officer had come to our house, and she's like, well, someone has called in a complaint, and that I had 10 days to get rid of him. 10 days? 10 days. <laughs> A neighbor's complaint highlighted the fact that the Johnson's property was not zoned for livestock, so they attempted to get a conditional use permit to redefine their property as a stock farm. The opposition cried foul. They're worried about setting precedents. If they give us a special permit, that what is next? Elephants, ostriches, zebras? Midlothian has a reputation as one of the best places to live in America. And some locals fear they may soon find themselves living near a designated farm. Uh, they've uh, suggested that we should move. And how nasty have that been? They've gotten pretty bad. They've gotten you know, to the point that I guess we can call it bullying. This winter has not been kind to pig owners. A woman and her pot belly Hobie were thrown off a U.S. Airways flight after the pig caused a ruckus pre-takeoff. And in Arkansas... I feel like I've been witch-hunted. Jill Latham's pet pig, Suey, has become a pet peeve for some of her neighbors. Though she researched and found her Vietnamese potbelly was considered an acceptable pet in Little Rock, some in the community began complaining, claiming Suey was making too big of a mess in Jill's backyard and posing a hazard to local property values. She, at one time, got a petition and was going to get the neighbors to sign it so she could keep the pig. No one signed the petition. Nobody. To Jill's dismay, the fight went all the way to the city council. I am the reason we are wasting our time in a city board meeting talking about a potbelly pig. The council's reading of the laws? Yes, you can have a pet pig in Little Rock, but you'll need a 300-foot buffer of land between you and your neighbors. Jill does not. She was given 30 days to say so long to Suey. Facing eviction, Suey is now suing because Jill has decided to head to federal court. I'm not willing to back down. The pet is a part of my family. Back in Virginia, the Johnsons are waging their own battle at a meeting of county supervisors. And lots of folks have something to say about it. I believe it's going to be very difficult to grant this request for conditional use permit and then in the future to deny someone else's. Please give our community closure and please deny this appeal. When Mark Johnson gets up to speak, he makes a difficult admission. I am a man with a psychological disability. A disability triggered by tragedy. 